presenter this evening is Kate Sinding Daly. She is the executive director of North Light Foundation, which is the family foundation of Dan and Cheryl Tishman, and focuses on advancing equitable and enduring solutions for environmental and human health. Prior to her current role, she was senior advisor to the president, president of the Natural Resources Defense Council, and before that, a senior attorney and deputy director of the council's New York program. Before joining them in 2006, she was a partner in, in a specialty environmental law firm. She has taught environmental law at Columbia University and Fordham University. She is a graduate of New York University School of Law, the Woodrow Wilson School of International and Public Affairs at Princeton University and Barnard College. Kate, we are happy to have you here with us. Please give a warm welcome to Kate Sending Daly. Thank you, Gloria. Um, thanks to Gmall for having me. Thanks to those of you who uh, trekked out here in the snow and to those who are joining by Zoom. There's um, nothing like hearing your father's voice as the voice of God just before you begin a public presentation, but I'm, I'm very touched that my parents are joining us remotely. Um, so I want to begin this evening by acknowledging that as a uh, white woman of privilege, I am not from an environmental justice community. I don't represent an environmental justice community. There are a set of principles known as the Hemes principles for democratic organizing, which I'll, I'll come back to in a, in a little bit, but they were agreed to by a group of environmental justice organizations and mainstream white-led organizations as a set of rules by which to work in, uh, in collaboration. And I've highlighted the third, which is uh, to honor letting people speak for themselves. So I'm gonna try to do that here tonight. And I'm gonna present to you in my role as an ally to and collaborator with the environmental justice community which is how I've um, thought about my work over the past decade or so, first at NRDC and more recently since I've joined the, the field of philanthropy. I am a member of, uh, of, of, I'm sorry, a member of the board of an environmental justice organization, which is called the Center for Earth Energy and Democracy, or SEED. It's based in Minneapolis, and it's a, a key founder and participant in something called the Equitable and Just National Climate Forum, which I'm also gonna be talking about a little bit later. So my own perspectives on environmental justice as reflected by the title of today's uh, talk are that, uh, are that the, the EJ community, which has for far too long been treated like just another constituency with which to be transacted by the mainstream environmental community, like business, or labor or faith-based groups is in fact a core component of the larger environmental movement and in my view is the key to its ultimate success. One feature or, or a core feature of the environmental justice movement is that it experiences and addresses issues in an intersectional way. I know that's become a little bit of a, a catchphrase, but it actually comes out of the environmental justice movement in the first instance. And by that, what I mean is that people who are living in environmental justice communities experience climate and experience environment as issues that are intricately and, uh, and inextricably interrelated with issues relating to housing, healthcare, employment, education, and so on. And my view is that that broader view of the issues that is embodied by the movement is what is necessary for us to successfully address the climate crisis. All right, well, to state the obvious, um, and for those of you who uh, attended Ed Edward Cameron's um, speech a few weeks ago or who've been paying any attention to the news, um, we're in a profound moment right now. The infamous 2018 report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change told us that we have until 2030, or barely over eight years from now, to take drastic action to reduce, to, to avoid the most significant adverse impacts of climate change. We're just coming on the back end of the Glasgow conference, the, the so-called COP26 conference of the parties, where there were some important agreements that were made by countries, but it's widely accepted and recognized. They fall far short of what's necessary to address our imperative. And in the meantime, Congress continues to wrangle over legislation in Washington in what is arguably our last chance for significant climate action at the federal level. 
And by that, what I mean is in, in light of our current politics, our divisive politics, in light of predictions about upcoming elections, in light of the fact that the Supreme Court of the United States has taken up Massachusetts versus EPA under reconsideration, which was the case that gave the EPA the authority to regulate greenhouse gases in the first instance. This could well be the last bite at the federal apple within the time frame that the IPP says we need to take, IPPC says we need to take action. As I'll come back to at the end of the talk, the by bipartisan infrastructure framework passed last month and the Build Back Better Act, if passed in its current form, uh, will be an important start, but it won't be enough. The Biden administration can and will do as much as it can do through executive action over the next few years, but that's in the face of an increasingly unfriendly judiciary and the same electoral politics that I alluded to earlier. So how did we get into this position? The last time that the federal government took up meaningful, uh, or, or the Congress took up meaningful action on climate was with the so-called Waxman-Markey bill, which passed the House of Representatives in 20, 2009, but never made it to the floor of the Senate in 2010 for a vote. After that, the Obama administration, facing what has now become the familiar politics of refusal, absolute refusal by the Republicans to take up anything that the Democrats uh, support, resorted to attempting to address climate change purely through executive action in the so-called Clean Power Plan, which allowed for the regulation of greenhouse gas emissions from the power sector. Well, shortly after that came out, uh, Trump was elected, and we all know what happened after that. What did these two failures to take meaningful action have in common? Much has been written about that, and there are divert diverging opinions. But one common factor is that a critical part of the, of the larger environmental community, and that part of the larger environmental community that is closest to the issues, that is first and most impacted by the issues that we're trying to address, was not at the table for the conversation. At best, they were an afterthought invited in after the mainstream environmental organizations, including uh, my highly respected, brilliant, um, well-intentioned colleagues um, at, at NRDC and elsewhere um, and, and elected officials had already written the rule book and then asked them to come along and support it. So my own hypothesis, which is based on my experience coming out of a big green organization and since then, is that we have concentrated too much power and resources in a small number of large environmental organizations that do certain things extraordinarily well. They craft policy, they litigate, they develop science, but which in and of themselves are insufficient to constitute a successful social justice movement. If you look at recent social, successful social movements, and I won't use social justice because these include movements on the right, one feature that they all share in common is that in addition to what I would refer to as these top-down elements, they had intensive and extensive bottom-up community-led uh, components and organizing. If you look at the ACA, the, the Affordable Care Act, or the marriage equality movement, and how they fared since Trump's election versus climate, that is a common theme. So I'm going to back up for just a minute, and I'm going to uh, share some, some commonly um, understood definitions just to make sure that we're all on the same page about what we're talking about here this evening. So environmental justice is defined by the EPA as being the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. And environmental justice is a reaction to environmental racism, which has been defined as being whether by conscious design or institutional neglect, actions and decisions that result in the disproportionate exposure of people of color to environmental hazards and environmental health burdens. And then finally, climate justice, which is a more recent innovation, but obviously closely related to environmental justice, is a form of environmental justice and is the fair treatment of all people and the freedom from discrimination in the creation of policies and projects that address climate change, as well as the systems that create climate change and perpetuate discrimination. To put those definitions in context, I'm gonna give you a 
brief history of the environmental justice movement. Um, so arguably the environmental justice movement dates back to the civil rights era. Some cite Cesar Chavez's efforts at organizing farm workers in response to unfair labor practices, as well as exposure to toxins as being an early example of environmental justice organizing. In 1967, African-American students took to the streets of Houston to oppose a city garbage dump in their community that had, uh, that had claimed the life of a child. In 1968, residents of West Harlem fought, albeit unsuccessfully, against a sewage treatment plant in their community. Many of you have probably driven by that sewage treatment plant many times on the west side. Then in 1982, North Carolina announced a plan to move 6,000 truckloads of soil contaminated with PCBs from alongside 210 miles of the state's roadside to a landfill located in Warren County, one of what at that time was only a few counties in the state with a majority black population. Six weeks of marches and peaceful protests followed and over 400, 500 people, sorry, were arrested. The uh, opponents lost that battle, but it was the first environmental protest by people of color that garnered nationwide uh, attention. And the federal government took notice. The following year, in 1983, the Government Accountability Office issued a study called Siting of Hazardous Waste Landfills and Their Correlation with Racial and Economic Status of Surrounding Communities. And that study, which looked at hazardous waste facilities in the Southeast, found that three out of four hazardous waste landfills were located in, in communities where African-Americans made up at least 26% of the population. In 1987 was the first study, national study, that looked at this issue of disproportionate siting of uh, burdensome facilities in communities of color. And that, was, that study was done by the United Church of Christ Commission on Racial Justice, and it was titled Toxic Waste in the United States. That was the this was the first study to examine the issues of race, class, and the environmental and the environment on a national level. And it's critical in that it was able to definitively show that although socioeconomic status uh, of residents does play an important role in the siting and location of hazardous waste sites, residents' race was the single most important factor in that determination. Three years later in 1990, the uh, newly organized environmental justice community called in the mainstream environmental community for the first time and wrote a letter to the so-called Big Ten organizations, accusing them of racial bias in hiring, in policy development, and in board constitution. And it challenged them to address their toxic com contamination, to, to address toxic contamination in communities and workplaces of people in col of color and the poor. 1991 is the date that many uh, will credit as being the onset of the modern environmental justice movement, which in 1991 saw the first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit in Washington, DC, which resulted in the adoption of 17 principles of environmental justice, which continue to define the movement today. Shortly thereafter, in 1994, President Clinton issued Executive Order 12898. This was the first time that federal agencies were required to consider environmental justice and, and in disproportionate impacts, all agencies, in their decision making. And in 1996, as I alluded to earlier, the environmental community called in the mainstream environmental community for a meeting and urged them to sign on to the HEMAS principles that I referred to earlier. That's 30 years of history, just getting up to that point in time. And while there have been important victories, there's no question, um, they have been on a highly local level. You, we've seen the formation of landmark groups, Keystone Environmental Justice Groups, We Act, uh, West, West uh, Harlem Environmental Action, uh, the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice. But throughout all of that time, the environmental justice community was never really called into or included in the mainstream environmental community. To the contrary, over that same period of time, we continued to see lots of examples of the marginalization of the environmental justice community and bad behavior. Things like uh, environmental groups parachuting in 
to help communities, environmental justice communities, only to leave once they had assisted in whatever the matter was at hand, to fundraise around it for themselves and not the communities left behind and not to leave the communities with any additional capacity to fight the next battles coming down the line. And they continued to, to dis, uh, display a, a distinct lack of diversity. In 2014, an organization called Green 2.0 issued a report showing that although people of color are 36% of the US population and comprise 29% of the science and engineering workforce, they did not at that point exceed 16% of the staff in any of the organizations that they had surveyed. And the reality remains today in 2021 that disproportionate burdens continue to be uh, visited upon low-income communities and communities of color and as is well, well documented and well accepted at this point, the impacts of climate change are experienced most by communities of color and low-income communities. But there is, we're beginning to see a shift. Um, in the last couple of years in particular have seen a real shift. Not surprisingly, um, the, the racial uprisings of last summer had a galvanizing effect within the environmental community just as they did across the progressive community more broadly. This slide just highlights a number of networks and coalitions that are examples of groups working in concert to actively work across environmental justice and climate justice and the mainstream communities. I mentioned the Equitable and Just National Climate Forum. Um, th that's one such example. It's uh, a coalition of mainstream environmental groups or national groups and EJ groups that have all agreed to a set of principles that have all agreed to sign on to a platform in an effort to work together in a new way around climate just, uh, sorry, around climate policy. So it's a direct reaction to the failures of the Waxman-Markey bill and of the Clean Power Plan and an effort to ensure that those who are in the communities that are most impacted, that have the lived experience that must be brought to forging solutions, have a seat at the table, at the onset in policy conversations and play a co-equal role in the development of policy solutions. Within the community, there is an increased awareness that we can only make real progress if we tackle the intersectional nature of our crises, which is something that, as I said at the beginning, has always been core to the environmental justice and the climate justice communities. The great writer, feminist, and civil rights activist Audre Lorde famously said, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. And that has become something of a mantra in the environmental justice community and increasingly in the broader community. My argument is that taking this position is not just a matter of morality, although of course it is a moral issue, but it is increasingly also a matter of strategy. So now I'm gonna introduce the, the, the concept of just transition because really this concept just transition is what is at the center of what the environmental and climate justice communities are seeking to advance at a policy level. And what uh, just transition really is about is the idea that as we're gonna need necessarily to transition our economy off of reliance on the extractive industries and fossil fuels, and towards to a clean energy economy. We have to do that in a way that is just and equitable. And that has two key components to it. One is the recognition of historic injustices and righting the wrongs and ensuring that they're not perpetuated or aggravated. And the other is that there are many communities that are gonna be left behind in the transition and that we have an obligation to take those communities uh, uh, realities into consideration and factor them directly into our policy solutions at the outset. According to the Climate Justice Alliance, just transition strategies were first forged by labor unions and environmental justice groups who were rooted together in low-income communities of color and saw the need to phase out the industries that were harming workers, community health, and the planet, and at the same time provide just pathways for workers to transition to other jobs. This is probably hard for you to say, it's for you to see, and it's a, it's a complex slide. But the reason I included it is that what it shows is that proponents of just transition in truly envision 
a remaking of society from one of extraction, of resources, of labor, of health, of dignity, to one of regeneration. But not only are we seeing this concept of just transition starting to show up in conversation, we're actually really starting to see it show up in policy. And that's the exciting part of this. So not surprisingly, and as many of you undoubtedly know, California was long held up as the gold standard when it came to addressing climate change at the state level. And the famous AB 32 or the Global Warming Pollution Act of 2006 created the first system for limiting uh, carbon emissions on an economy-wide basis. And the mechanism for doing that is called cap and trade. And the way cap and trade works is that you establish a cap of the maximum amount of carbon emissions that are permitted within a certain geographic area. And then you issue allowances or permits basically to pollute. And those can be auctioned and they can be traded between companies. And if you think about it on an economy-wide level, there's a lot of appeal to that. It makes a lot of sense. The environmental justice community has long had concerns about cap and trade, however, because cap and trade doesn't take into consideration distributional impacts. And the concern has long been that the mechanism in its simplest form favors economic efficiency over distributional equity. Put another way, it provides a, a compliance path of least economic polluters that very likely can result in not only a perpetuation of the most polluting facilities remaining in low-income communities and communities of color, but actually those communities seeing an increase as those kinds of facilities are retired in other places. So the EJ community was actually strongly opposed to AB 32 when it passed. 10 years later, in reaction to that fact, California passed a new set of companion bills. The first one ratcheted down the cap, but the second one squarely addressed equity issues and it required the state in, regu in, in promulgating regulations to, uh, to impose those limitations on carbon emissions to take into account the state's most impacted and disadvantaged communities and to prioritize specified emission reductions in those communities. In 2019, New York passed what is uh, fondly known as the CLCPA, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which at the time was called the most ambitious and equitable climate law in the nation. I want to take a moment to say, because this is, this is near and dear to my heart, it's something I worked on for many years in my prior uh, career, every year in New York State, the assembly passed an 80 by 50 reduction bill, 80% reduction in carbon emissions by 2050. It was following the California standard and it was gonna replicate it in New York. And every year it never made it to the Senate for a vote or if it did, it failed. And about five or six years ago, a coalition of groups that included EJ groups, some mainstream environmental groups, climate justice groups said, we gotta stop doing this. This is ridiculous. If we're gonna address climate, and we're going to we're going to have meaningful reductions in carbon in carbon emissions we want to bake in principles of just transition we're going to do this in a different way and that's exactly what the CLCPA does so it mandates an 85% reduction in greenhouse gases and requires carbon neutrality in New York state by 2050 at the same time, it mandates that a minimum of 35% of the benefits of clean energy and energy efficiency funding go to disadvantaged communities. <clears throat> the mechanism for implementing the law is the creation of something called the Climate Action Council, which may sound sort of familiar to people in Vermont. But what's different about this council is that it's supported by a whole series of working groups including importantly, a just transition working group and a separate climate justice working group. And some of the first orders of business of those groups are to help define what is meant by benefits of, of uh, clean energy and energy efficiency funding and what is meant by disadvantaged communities. I will say that the, the, uh, the proponents of the law have understood that to mean low-income communities and communities of color, the same ones that are hit first and worst by the climate crisis. And then last year, Illinois passed what many called 
the most ambitious and equitable climate law in the nation. And again, this was a law that, that passed as a result of a widespread coalition of environmental justice, climate justice, and mainstream environmental groups. Obviously, the coalition is broader than that. I'm, I'm excluding some of the stakeholders. But <clears throat> this law requires 100% zero emission power sector by 2045, another way of saying carbon neutral, with significant reductions before then. But it also, as you can see, has sig requires significant investments in job training and to replace lost property taxes and develop, develop economic development in communities that are impacted by a transition away from reliance on fossil fuels to clean energy. So many of those, many of us who have been advocating this approach for some time have seen the passage of these laws and others. There's a similar law in Washington state. Um, here in New England, there are increasingly tables, EJ tables that are being lifted up and, and having more and more prominent roles in statewide conversations around climate as evidence that there is validity to this approach. And that in fact, the most significant climate laws that have been passed and are passing right now are ones that bake in this just transition concept, the core of the environmental justice communities uh, advocacy. I'm gonna talk, talk briefly now about federal action um, because you know, when those of us who are in this business routinely say it's really difficult to measure progress when you're talking about policy or when you're talking about uh, movements. And it's true. And frequently we'll do things like claim credit when Waxman Markey passes the house only to have that actually ultimately re result in a failure or when the clean power plan is promulgate promulgated by EPA. But I think we do have a measure of progress right now in that We've gone beyond having just transition be a, a concept and conversation, and we're seeing it show up, as I said, not only in state policies, but now also being reflected in the Biden administration's approach to climate. It's seen in the appointments of the Biden administration. Uh, EJ champions are in agencies from EPA to DOE to OMB, and in some of some of its policy uh, initiatives. One of the first um, executive orders that President Biden signed on January 27th of this year is called Justice 40. And it is modeled explicitly on New York's climate law, but goes a little bit further. And it requires that 40% of benefits from federal climate investments must go to disadvantaged communities. At the same time, that executive order created a first ever White House uh, Environmental Justice Advisory Council, which sits within the White House to advise the, the uh, administration and the agencies as to how to implement that executive order. Build back better. Um, Edward noted in his talk a few weeks ago that much um, has been gutted out of Build Back Better. Much of that is due to politics of a certain senator from a certain coal dependent state. But, um, and that's true. I mean, there's no question about it. There's much that was included in the original Build Back Better that we need, and, and that's been stripped out. But even still, um, there are significant uh, climate provisions in Build Back Better, including ones that advance environmental justice priorities. The um, Equitable and Just National Climate Forum that I referred to early, earlier has calculated those benefits at $162.9 billion in the version of, of Build Back Better that was passed by the House. And I just wanna stress here um, to emphasize this point about the intersectionality and interconnectedness of issues. In that tally, they're including things like clean transportation, uh, environmental um, and, and climate justice block grants, pollution-free energy and energy efficiency, but they're also including things like investments in affordable and sustainable housing, education and workforce development, and, work and worker disability compensation, and resilience. And this is on top of the bipartisan infrastructure framework that was signed into law just a few days before the House passed Build Back Better, which the EJNCF calculates contains an additional $65.7 billion in benefits for environmental justice communities. So that's represents real progress, albeit inadequate progress. So where do we go from here? 
obviously at the federal level, um, it's about how much more can we do in the next couple of years, if, if um, you know, based on the, my, my um, how I framed the issue at the outset in terms of a, a rapidly closing window. And then it comes down to how much we can implement. But because of that rapidly closing window, and because we're not going to achieve on a policy level what we need to at a federal level, me, realistically, within the time frame that we're told we need to do it, I believe the focus is going to increasingly turn to the subnational level, and it's going to turn to the work that's happening at the states and in regions. And I believe there's huge opportunity there. It's represented by some of the laws that I highlighted today, in addition to some of the work that's going on um, in places like New England. I think both in terms of their own right and in terms of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions that they represent, as well as the commitments to a just transition, but also importantly, in terms of our ability to show up on the, in, on the international stage, the actions taken by these states and these regions are gonna be paramount. And I further believe that we need to, in, do, in doing that work, we're gonna need to build on the examples of New York, Illinois, Washington, and other states and regions. In, in what have been the, the most recent spate of examples of success in taking on climate. And the last thing I wanna say about this is that I focused a lot on the environmental justice community because that has been my focus, but I don't wanna leave out the part that is about reaching across the aisle and the promise that I think the just transition framework has to make climate a, an issue that actually can garner bipartisan support. Not probably by talking about it in those terms, but through actions. Because much of what's embodied in Just Transition speaks directly to those communities in poor, those in, in poor rural communities who already have been, or feel like they have been, or will be left behind as we transition away from coal and other extractive industries. And we can build a broader coalition, again, not through words, but by, through actions, if we, uh, if we implement just transition strategies in those communities. And I want to just give one example um, from my own work that, um, that supports why I think this is possible. One of our grantee partners is the Telluride Foundation. And the Telluride Foundation, as you can imagine, is located in a very, very deep blue, blue part of Colorado. But just to the west of Telluride, and where many of wor the workers in Telluride come from, is a small community, a small cluster of communities called Nucla Natarita in a very deep red part of the state. And those communities are in the midst of a transition off of coal. They've been reliant for the last many, many decades on coal mining and on jobs in a coal fired power plant. And that coal fired power plant is closing, and that mine is closing, and those jobs are going away. And the Telluride Foundation, in nonpartisan terms, without talking about climate, without talking about just transition, has come in to work in partnership with that community to develop a set of strategies for how that community can not only continue to exist, but thrive and do better than it had done in, in reliance on, on the coal industry. And so there are three buckets um, that that looks like in, in this particular community. One, given its location, has to do with outdoor recreation and the hospitality industry and tourism that surrounds that. The second is based on local food and regenerative agriculture. And then a third is based on small businesses. 150 new small businesses have been started in this tiny little cluster of communities in the three years that the Telluride Foundation has been working there. That's an example of philanthropic uh, intervention, but it's an example of the kind of success that can be lifted up and magnified in support of government intervention and the kinds of policy enactment that we need to see to bring about the just transition and ultimately to address the climate crisis. And I'm gonna end there and um, invite any questions or comments from our audience. Thank you very much indeed. That's very interesting. But um, what to me was notably absent was any mention of reaching out and getting the support from the corporate community. Uh, it's all very well talking about uh, the disadvantaged communities and the disadvantage that, but they're not the pe people who actually control the money. They're not the people who control business, not the people who control corporations. 
So what has environmental justice done or is doing to actually uh, get the corporate community on your side? Yeah, no, that's a, that's an excellent question. And I, I want to um, start by saying that um, there is absolutely no question in my mind that the engagement of the corporate community is, is critical um, and, and that we will not get there without the engagement of the corporate community because even with the picture that I presented about policy change at the state and, and, and regional and, and federal level, um, we're not gonna get there through policy alone. And what I would say is that the environmental justice community um, would, and, and again, I really wanna be very careful not to speak for the environmental justice community here, but in my observation of how the environmental justice community operates, um, I think they would see their role as being one of calling out um, corporate the, the corporate sector. So what they would see is that there is a wide spectrum of actors that collectively make up the environmental movement, each of which play critically important roles, and that they represent the left flank of that movement. They represent the, the part of that movement that drags us to the left, that drags policy to the left, that drags the narrative to the left, and that enables others within the movement to exert pressure on the corporate sector. That's a perfect example of why, and I, if I didn't say this explicitly, I, I meant to, I in no, may, in no way mean to um, imply that the environmental justice community by itself is sufficient either. My argument has been that we've overinvested in other parts of the movement, including those parts of the movement that very ably do engage with and take on the corporate sector uh, to the exclusion of this other crucial part of the overall movement. Um, I perceive that the uh, that environmental issues tend to be um, under uh, that they they tend to be liberal issues politically. The uh, the liberal um, part of our country has a history of uh, having the uh, perfect being the enemy of the good. I'm, I wonder if the issues of justice ever get in the way of simple environmental progress. That is an excellent question. Um, and it is, um, and, and it is true. What, what I, I agree with, with the, with the, um, the thesis that that frequently in in the progressive community we let the, the perfect be the enemy of the good, um, and I don't want to sugarcoat that um, that this kind of collaboration and this kind of involvement of of the environmental justice and climate justice community in the larger movement is not challenging. Um, I guess what I would say, and I would I would again um, highlight the equitable and just national climate. Um, forum, which I alluded to earlier, is that my own belief, and this is true whether you're talking about, again, the mainstream community and, and justice or the mainstream community and other stakeholders with which there aren't person, uh, which, with, with which there are not perfect alignment, um, that the first step, the key is to, to getting into relationship um, and to developing trust-based relationship first and, and most significantly. And that is time consuming, um, but it's absolutely crucial work. And what I have seen um, happen multiple times is that when that effort is made and when those relationships are forged, gr groups who have differing opinions on policy or on, the, on what the solutions are can work together collaboratively, even if they can't come into to total alignment. I'll give one example, which is not an EJ example, but that comes from my own work. I spent most of my time when I was at NRDC working on fracking um, and working on fracking in New York State. And when I started working on that issue at NRDC, NRDC very firmly had the position that natural gas had an important role to play as a transition fuel. And so NR NRDC's position within the ecosystem of environmental organizations in New York State was that we should be for responsible regulation of fracking and that we should that it was unrealistic to think that we should ban fracking and 
we were despised, <laughs> pilloried by many in the anti-fracking community who saw us as traitors to the cause, um, and, and who held up nothing less than a pure ban on fracking as being an acceptable um, uh, goal. Um, but we worked across that difference. We, we fought a lot, but we came back together and we made a commitment to each other that even if we weren't gonna advocate for the same thing, we were not gonna undercut one another and that we were gonna thereby, it's, it kind of goes back to this left flank right flank issue. We were gonna be able to move the issue further than we would be able to otherwise, even if we weren't able to be in complete alignment. And in the context of the Equitable and Just National Climate Forum, I've seen that in conversations around the so-called clean energy standard, which unfortunately is one of the pieces that came out of Build Back Better. But there were real profound disagreements between the environmental justice groups and some of the national groups around what should be considered clean energy, most significantly being around um, nuclear, waste to energy, biofuels. And what the groups did was start by, first of all, leveling the playing field in terms of what their understanding of what those technologies are. Um, so they brought in outside experts to talk about what the technologies are. Then they shared about what their respective positions were relative to those issues. And then they agreed to disagree, but they also agreed that they went, when they were gonna go into Hill meetings, they were gonna be transparent about where those disagreements were. And that brought a kind of credibility to them coming in as advocates that was recognized by, uh, by decision makers on the Hill. Um, that fell out of the Build Bad Better plan. We don't know what would have happened at the, you know, ultimately with, with that and, and which parts would stay and would not stay, but it is a model of how, how to work together across that kind of difference. Thank you. Well, you've given a really good um, overview of how environmental justice has progressed and where it is at in the United States, um, a wealthy country. Can you comment briefly on what's happening in your field in Europe and in the rest of the world, the developing world? Is there any effort for environmental justice in much of the world? There absolutely is. And it's, it's not my area of expertise or the focus of my foundation, but it is the focus of some very, very significant um, players, including the Ford Foundation, which has been all, all in on addressing these issues of um, of, of equity on an international level. Yeah, I mean, this is, you saw this front and center in, in Glasgow, right? Where, where the, and, and it's been going on for 20, 30 years, where the, the countries that have done the least to contribute to the climate crisis have said, it is inequitable to expect us to carry a co-equal burden for addressing those issues. Um, and, uh, and there were some commitments made at COP in term, and there have been commitments made over the years in terms of um, both resource transfers and, and technology transfers and information transfers to address some of those inequities. They, they remain inadequate, um, but it is absolutely a, a very important conversation on the international level. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask in terms of like allyship, in terms of reaching across the aisle, how do you start that conversation when personally, in my experience, it feels like there's a stumbling block of not even acknowledging that climate change exists or not even acknowledging that racism and bias exists in our society today. So how do you move that conversation forward when it seems to not even be able to even start? I know like it's not necessarily, you don't wanna speak for other EJ groups, but in your experience and in your work, have you had any of those conversations and how have you navigated them, I guess? Um, yeah, just so, so I understand when you're talking about um, reaching across, so you're talking about reaching across the aisle to conservatives um, when you talk about climate denial and so on. Yeah, I mean, look, I wish I had an easy, I, I wish I had an easy answer to that. I wish, I, I wish we had um, demonstrated um, evidence of what, of what works there. Um, what I will say, um, a couple of things. Um, I will say, first of all, that climate denialism um, is, is on the decline. I mean, just too many people are, experience the impact, are experiencing the impacts directly um, to deny it. Some of that is shifting to, to saying, well, 
it's happening, but there's nothing we can do about it. So why should we suffer in the meantime? And we're just going to have to, you know, do what we can do or other kinds of, um, uh, you know, what I would consider non-solutions oriented um, reactions. Um, but uh, I think there's a gettable part of the population that is experiencing that knows it's real and that can be brought in with the right kinds of um, messengers, messages, and again, policy solutions that speak directly to, the, to their concerns and, and their, uh, their lived experiences. Um, I would argue that the environmental movement and the environmental justice component of the movement probably isn't gonna be <laughs> the best messengers for that, right? But I think that again, if you take a, a broad view of what constitutes a, so, a successful social movement, there are many roles to play and you would identify other players within, within that ecosystem um, who I think can, again, not speaking in those terms um, per se, not talking about climate per se, um, but advancing policies that address the interests and concerns of people, the real lived experiences and concerns can make advances. Looking at the ominous deadline of two, 2030 for meaningful climate reversal, which is more important in the end to that cause, our survival, speed, or absolute justice? I don't think that there, I, I, the whole premise of my, of my talk and, and, and my work is that those aren't, uh, those are, you can't separate those. We will not get those carbon emission reductions if we don't incorporate justice and a whole of society perspective. We've seen that. Didn't happen in 2009, didn't happen in 2016. We've had ample time to address it by just looking at how many molecules of carbon dioxide we need to re remove from the atmosphere. Policies that are divorced from the lived experiences of people on the ground aren't getting enacted. And if they are getting enacted, they aren't durable. So that's exactly the point of my, uh, uh, of, uh, that I'm trying to make here. Policy solutions have to include the perspectives of those who are first and most impacted if they're gonna generate the broad-based popular support necessary to pass and to endure. What green technologies are now available that you believe would really make a big difference? And why are they not in greater use and they're not more mainstream? Well, that's a little bit outside of my main area of expertise. I'm, I'm not a technical person. Um, I, you know, I think we know for, from the power, reducing emissions from the power sector, what we need to do are scale up solar and, and wind um, as rapidly as possible. Um, I think we know from the transportation sector, we need to electrify that sector as quickly as possible. And then the electricity again generated to power those vehicles has to come from renewable energy. Uh, that said, there's got to be more that there's more that we're going to have to do. And there's a lot of talk about direct air capture of carbon, for example. So pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it into other productive uses. Um, you know, I think. I think that um, those remain emerging technologies and I, there's a lot of innovation that's going. I think some of them will probably prove to be viable and others not so much. Um, and, and others may even cause unintended consequences that, that worsen the problem. So um, this is just a period where we need to be um, supporting as much innovation um, as possible. And again, this is where the corporate sector is absolutely crucial and, and we need the policies to support the corporate sector and we also need the, the, the public campaigns that bring the, the corporate sector um, along to, to rapidly deploy technologies as, as quickly as they can. Um, I have a question about um, battling with the uh, fossil fuel companies, uh, corporations, uh, who obviously are taking a very strong um, stance in kind of impeding and blocking the um, significant progress of uh, healing the planet. And um, granted, their um, financial investments are huge. And um, 
I imagine on a legal level, there's something going on um, in the environmental um, organizations to fight the fossil fuel corporate interests. And obviously that would be a very significant and important uh, aspect of the um, struggle to somehow unravel the um, um, blockages to progress on, on that level. So um, the question is, um, what do you see as this main strategy to um, lessen that obstacle to progress? Yeah. Um, yeah, the, obviously that's, you know, in, in many ways that is the biggest obstacle to, to progress. There are a couple of interesting things happening. There's some really interesting litigation right now um, that's being brought by municipalities and at, at least one state that are suing um, the, the, you know, the big fossil fuel producers um, for under, under uh, common law tort um, causes of action on the basis that there's ample evidence that they knew what the impacts of their products were and that they continued to perpetuate significant harm. Um, those cases, which uh, I, I think a lot of people at the beginning thought were long shot cases, are faring much better than people thought they would. They've been surviving um, some of the early motions to dismiss. And the thought is that if those cases can get beyond early motions to dismiss and get into the discovery stage, where you can really force these companies to have to provide huge amounts of documentary and other evidence, um, that, that that becomes a huge incentive to get them to the table um, to negotiate on policy solutions because the potential downside is, is so huge. So I would say it still remains um, a little bit of an outside strategy, but I personally think it's got a lot of promise and, and, it's, and it's exciting. I think the other piece is we got to fight them um, in the communications game. And we've been, we being the environmental community writ large, have been really bad at that. Um, but I think we're getting better. I think we're getting smarter. I think there are a lot of folks coming out of politics who've learned a lot about digital organizing and learned a lot about effective messaging and effective um, uh, persuasion that are bringing some very sophisticated tools to, uh, to the communications game. What we need now are the resources. And the good news on that is, you know, we got a lot of new billionaire funders in the climate space. We've got Jeff Bezos pledging a billion dollars. Um, you know, we've got his ex-wife putting hundreds of million, millions of dollars. We've got real resources on the table at this point. And if they're deployed in a smart way, I think we can engage on their battleground. What role do you see for shareholder activism? I think shareholder activism is, is an incredibly important tool. Um, I think, again, it's, it's only one tool that we need to deploy, um, but, you know, again, as, as the impacts of climate are, of climate change are more and more evident, um, as more and more um, groups are being motivated to take action on climate, I think that that particular strategy is one that um, we can be deploying more effectively than we have in the past. Uh, I'd like to return to the business of corporate. It, it seems to me, and this is also tied up with your communication point, <clears throat> it seems to me that quite often climate change is presented too often as a threat as opposed to, an op as opposed to being an opportunity. <clears throat> and if you're going to get corporate interest, you've got to sort of be able to sell it to them as to why should they do it. They're only thinking of quarterly reports. They're, 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 uh, and, and politicians, particularly in this country, only think two years ahead. Uh, it seems to me uh, and, uh, that, 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 that one of the problems with the environmental effort is that it's constantly being presented as a threat, as opposed to uh, really sort of saying, look at the possibilities, look at what can be done, look at what can be achieved. And uh, I, 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 th I personally think more should be done in that direction. 
I agree with you. Um, and I wouldn't limit that just to corporate engagement. I think there's lots of evidence that as human beings, our, hum our, our nature is to, to shut down in the face of, uh, of crisis or in the face of the presentation of a problem that just feels too big for us to, to grapple with. Not everybody. Obviously, there are lots of people who do respond to that. But um, I think probably the majority of people do not. And, and so I, I agree with you. I think we need to, to and, and I think, you know, it has the benefit of being true. I, I truly believe, um, you know, as I, as I indicated this evening, that the opportunities attendant with the embrace of this tr just transition approach um, are, are tremendous and will result in um, benefits that go far beyond, you know, the bottom line of corporations and will result in, 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 in better lived life experiences for many people. We have a question from the Zoom audience. How is Vermont doing in this area? You know, I actually, um, I think Vermont is doing well, <laughs> but not as well as it could is how I would answer that. Um, and again, this, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on Vermont. I, you know, obviously there was important, important legislation that's been passed that's in the, in the process of being implemented. There have been um, public sessions all across the state and the council is preparing um, its recommendations to the legislature. Um, Edward said a few weeks ago, and I agree with him, they're not likely to go as far as they need to go, um, but you know, they're, they're gonna be steps in the right direction. It was really interesting though, actually, I, I was in um, Manchester Medical Center the other day getting my booster and I saw a stack of flyers on, on the table um, from 350.org that had sort of a poster about center, you know, it, it was something about climate justice now, which I thought was really interesting because um, it, it, to me, it was evidence that this, this narrative or this messaging around justice having to be a core component of how we think about addressing this issue, the totality of the issues um, is, uh, you know, is, is, is reaching farther corners. Uh, regarding Vermont, um, can you discuss a bit about um, environmental justice on the policies that you've seen? A lot is being made on the right about the costs to our most vulnerable people in this state of the carbon capture, carbon elimination of policies, like gas and heating homes, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so the, the short answer is I can't speak uh, in, in, in much depth about that. What I can, what I can say generally is that um, those are real concerns. And again, you asked the question about the international um, context. Frequently, one of the things that's brought up is if we phase out of fossil fuels, we're denying that first energy transition to, to, poor, to poor countries that just want to be able to have, you know, not be able, not have to cook their food over, um, over, over what, you know, open fires. And, and um, so, I, you know, those are real concerns. And what I would just say is that they have to be factored into the, to the creation of the policy in, in such a way that, um, that low income communities and communities of color are not left facing higher bills. They're going to have to be, that's going to have to be subsidized in some way or another, um, probably at some point by a price on carbon that's paid by those who are polluting in the first instance. Yeah, we do have a, we do have a question from the Zoom audience. I like the question from the audience in your follow up advocating how net zero will actually be an opportunity and bring prosperity for all people in the world. What examples can you point to so far? Where is there more written about this? Well, I I, I provided one example when I talked about the the communities in Colorado that have been going through this transition. And these, you know, these are folks, again, this is deeply conservative country. These are people who liked working for the coal company um, and liked working for the coal power plant and were not happy when it closed. Um, but they're people who have engaged now of necessity in reimagining what um, their economy looks like, what their jobs look like, what their community looks like. 
Um, and I think we're going to have to, they're going to have to be lots and lots of micro examples like that, that are going to be able, that we're going to be able to lift up. Um, it's going to look different in every part of the country. Um, you know, coal country is one part of it, but the just transition in other parts of the country are going to look very different. You know, when, when, um, when the coal fired power plant closes down in, um, Tonawanda, New York, um, the mo majority of jobs that are going to be lost there aren't going to be jobs working in the power plant. They're going to be, or that are going to be at risk. They're going to be the uh, jobs that, that benefit from payments in lieu of taxes that are paid by the power company and support teachers and firefighters and police. And so we're going to, again, we're going to, this is, we have to think about the totality of, of the implications of the transition and we're gonna to need to think about policies in that very um, all of society kind of way. If there, if there are no other questions, I think we'll just end here. I wanna thank you, Kate, very much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. And thank you all for coming.